Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. If some days you doubt yourself and you don't know what you're doing, if you've ugly cried alone in your bedroom because you felt like you're failing, well, I just want you to know you're not alone and you have come to the right place. Raising tweens and teens in today's world is not easy, and I'm on a mission to equip you to love well and to raise emotionally healthy, happy tweens and teens that thrive. I believe that moms are heroes, and we have the power to transform our family and to impact future generations. If you are looking for answers, encouragement, and to become more of the mom and the woman that you want to be, welcome. I'm Cheryl Gould, and I am so glad that you're here. Hi, friend. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show today. And I am a big believer that behind every great mom is a mom who's pretty sure that she's screwing it up. And if you've ever had thoughts like, I'm a horrible mom, it's my fault, if I would have been a better mom, my kid wouldn't be struggling with this, that mom has done such a better job than me, look at her kid and how happy they are, or my kids deserve better than to have a mom like me. Well, these are all lies and they're things that we can all tell ourselves. And today I am interviewing Becky Bodwin and we are gonna unpack these lies. And not only are we gonna unpack these lies, we talk a lot about mom guilt. And when we're in that mom guilt and that shame pit, What can we do to get out of it? And how can we actually, when we're feeling that mom guilt, not the shame, we talk about the difference, when we're feeling that mom guilt, how can we actually use it for good and pivot? So there are so many great nuggets in this podcast. And Becky has just released her latest book, Enjoy Every Minute, and other ridiculous things we say to moms. This interview is honest, vulnerable, comforting, and reassuring, and I can't wait for you to listen. Well, welcome, Becky, to the show, and I am so excited about what we're going to be talking about and your new book that just came out, Enjoy Every Minute and Other Ridiculous Things We Say to Moms. This is going to be good. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes, your book is so good. And I love how honest you are, how open and transparent you are. And it was interesting because I've been reading your book and I was talking with a mom that I coach and work with. And she was saying, I'm loving, you know, I I really enjoy listening to podcasts, but I get really discouraged when I hear moms talk and they sound like they have it, they figured it out now and they've arrived and now they've written a book and I'm still in it. And I don't know if I'm going to have a happy ending. (laughs) I, it just was such a reminder to keep it real, to keep it raw here on the podcast. I'm like this, after she said that, I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm having Becky on tomorrow because that's what we're going to do. And that's what your book is all about. So let me start off by asking you, we'll just jump right into this. What are one or two of your biggest mom fails? Well, my biggest, um, I would say mom fail, my biggest area of struggle over the years has been my anger, managing my anger, controlling my anger. And it's not exactly what you might think. It's not like I'm just an angry person. Um, I didn't think I would be an angry mom. But I write in the book, I talk about the first time I lost my temper, like really just lost it in front of my daughter. She was only six months old. And um, I didn't get mad at her. I got mad about the circumstances. She was sick. She had an ear infection. I, for some reason, felt guilty that I had allowed her 
to get sick. I know it's irrational, but I felt like I must have done something wrong. And I was getting conflicting advice from my chiropractor and my pediatrician, whether or not I should give her the antibiotic, then I'd have to give her probiotics. And I just, I just didn't want to mess up at all. I felt so much pressure. So she was sitting in her bouncy seat and I got the liquid antibiotic and I squirted it in her mouth and she spit it all out. And it just ran down the front of her, all over her shirt. And I just flipped out. It was like, I just lost it because now I didn't know how much she had swallowed. Am I supposed to give her another dose? Do I give her half a dose? And I walked into my kitchen and we were in a small apartment. So it was all in one space. And I slammed the cabinet door and then I grabbed the frying pan off the stove that still had our scrambled eggs in it from the morning. And I flung it in the sink and I started yelling. And then I caught her out of the corner of my eye and she was just looking at me like startled. Yeah. I immediately felt so much guilt and felt like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible mom. That's what I was just thinking. And I remember thinking, she's young. She'll never remember this and I'll never do it again. <laughs> and of course I did. And over the years, I think I just over and over found myself in situations where I didn't know what to do. I was stressed out. I felt like I was inadequate, ill-equipped yeah. and anger is for some reason, I think partly because I grew up in a home where there was a lot of anger, but that was sort of like my leading emotion that would come out. So I have a lot of stories in the book just about struggles over the years and kind of what I did stumbling forward, I would say, as I would get better at handling my emotions, but also figuring out what's underneath because underneath my, my anger, a lot of times is fear. Yeah, I, I love how you make that connection and how you shared that here you were trying so hard to do everything right, but you're getting conflicting messages and don't give her the antibiotic, give her the antibiotic. She's yeah. sick. It's your fault. Yeah. And all of that is just stuffed inside. And yeah. then that happens and you blew, you know, yeah, I blew <laughs> and I've blown many times over the years and um, it's been a process. It's, I've, it's definitely gotten better. And I think I've become more emotionally healthy overall to be able to deal with the fear that's underneath. And also this, when you realize you don't have control, it's a terrible, it's one thing when you don't have control over things for your own life, but when you are, you know, you have these children and you realize you can't control what happens to them either, or you can't control them. It's just, it's really, really hard, you know? Yeah, it is. And and you have four girls, right? I have three girls. Three girls. Okay. Three, yes. And one's getting married. Yep. And yes. then and then is she the one that and then one's going to college? Or t well, tell me, tell our listeners. Yeah. So they're 21, 19, no, 22, 19. I'm sorry. <laughs> They've all had birthdays. <laughs> they're 22, 20, and 15. So my oldest is, the older two are in college, but Kate okay. is graduating next weekend from nursing school and then getting married. And then her and her husband will be moving to England for their first year of marriage so he can do grad school. And then my 20-year-old is a sophomore in college. And then we still have a 15-year-old at home. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I, I want to like simultaneously get the Kleenex out uh -huh. And also get excited for you. And, yes. You know, I mean, oh, talk about not having control. Yes. You know, at the age, the ages that your kids are. Yeah. And having tweens and teens, but then having your daughter get married mm -hmm. and then move away. Yeah. What is, what's that like for you? It's, um, it's a lot of letting go. And I feel like I just keep in my relationship with her seeing that she's ready. Like she's been becoming you know, this adult and she's, she's ready, but it's me having to, to let go. And it's not easy. I'm excited. And it's, I know it's going to be, it's going to be hard too. It's going to yeah, be a mixed yeah. bag. Yes, it is. And that's a great point because we can feel so many feelings all at once. Yeah. And this stage of life, when you have tweens, teens, young adults, there's a lot of that letting go. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's not easy to do. Tell our listeners first, let's just start with what led you to write, write the book. So this is my second book, but I feel like 
in some ways, I feel like it's my first because I've been writing it for like 10 years. I started um, writing and speaking to moms about 10 years ago. I had a column in the um, Daily Herald. It's a newspaper in Chicago called A Mom's Point of View, where I just wrote every month for almost five years. I wrote just anything I wanted to about being a mom, my experience as a mom. It was such a great way for me to cut my teeth as a writer. And then that led me into speaking at mom's groups. So I love doing this. I've been doing it for a long time. And one of my favorite things after I share a message is then sitting in on the group discussion afterwards. And I always ask the leader, is it okay if I sit at a table? Cause that's where I get to hear mm. what these moms have to say, you know, and what their takeaways were, what resonated with them, what their experiences are, their hilarious stories. And I just have been, I just, put that back into writing. So I've had a lot of this content for a long time. I just, it needed to be the right time for me to kind of piece it all together and find a way to make it work. Yeah. And, all the and, important things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. And well, and you do um, have a lot of humor in the book too. I was yes. laughing. I was laughing out loud with uh, the teenager chapter and yeah. that's really, there was some really funny things in there. Yes. Well, I wanted it to be a book that I think it makes you laugh. And I think it makes moms, some moms cry too, because they're just so hungry to hear words that will encourage them and let them know they're not alone. And then there's so much humor in there too. I had a lot of fun with the, it's basically 12 cliches or myths that I sort of pick apart and look at, and some of them are really funny. So I had a lot, it gave me a good structure to kind of talk about a lot of the important things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Did you have um, a stronger feelings around one of the chapters, like something that like really, I wasn't planning on asking you this question, but yeah. like something that, you know how you have somebody say something and what Becky's explaining is every chapter is something that we say like a platitude that isn't true, yeah. right? And yeah. is that how you would explain it? But yeah. we say it to each other. Like, oh, yes. one chapter is, oh, just wait till they become teenagers. Yeah. And yes, there's, you talk about, yes, there's truth in that. Raising teenagers can be really tough, but you normalize that as well. And yes. You and there's a good, there's so many good things. And why do we say that to young moms when they're already overwhelmed with their kids and then we throw out their just wait till they become teenagers. It's just like a funny thing that we say, you know, that's not really helpful. Yeah. And yeah. it slaps a little bit more fear on there that we, we yes. already have enough of. <laughs> For sure. That's what overwhelms young moms is thinking that, you know, but to answer your question, I think the, um, so chapter four is probably the one that I just felt, I talk about mom guilt in this chapter. And I talk about what I call broken parenting. So some of the, for me, the anger that I feel like, you know, I was doing an interview with someone and I talked about growing up in a home where there was a lot of anger. And she said, it's really like you, in, you were an intern in the school of anger. And when she said that, that made a lot of sense to me because it's what I saw. It's, it's what I learned. And it's sort of like my knee jerk reaction, you know, when something feels out of control or I feel upset. Um, so I talk about that, but the mom guilt was, it's something that I hear from moms all the time. And so I really wanted to talk about that. So that I put in the chapter, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, which so it's fun to talk about because some people will still say, well, that's really true. But my point is that's a lot of pressure to put on a mom that the mom has to kind of make everyone happy, keep everyone happy. She's got to be happy. And if she's struggling, then it's almost like there's not space or understanding for that. So I talk about mom guilt. I talk about um, anxiety and depression. And that's really my favorite chapter too, because I share a lot of stories from other moms. I asked other moms to contribute. So I think it's very well-rounded because I'm only one mom, you know, I yes, don't experience yes, everything. Yes. So I really wanted it to be other voices and other experiences as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's a great chapter and I really want to dig in to the mom guilt, because it is something that we all struggle with, especially in this generation. I'm like, what, what happened? I don't think my, I, now I think that my mom felt guilty about some things, but not to the level that we feel yeah. uh, with the mom guilt. And I thought that your friend that you had share in the book and what was her name again? 
um, I wrote her name down. I think you, it was Beth. Um, yeah, you were, talked about yeah. because we're inundated yes. so much with so many parenting books and there's just so much now. I mean, my mom had Dr. Spock. <laughs> you know I mean? Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, why do you think that we, we struggle with that so much? Do you have any theories behind that? With, with mom guilt? Yeah. I mean, I think what you just said, when you think about the, the quantity of advice and information, especially over the last year, when you just look at COVID and everything related to the pandemic, you know, and trying to help our kids through that. It's like, I don't even know what resources I can trust. I don't even know who to look at and say, okay, this person is the person I want to follow because they have it figured out. There's so much information and oftentimes conflicting. And then we also have social media and sort of this comparison that we're constantly seeing people who really look like they have it all together. They look like they're killing it. And we, you know, look at that and just think, why am I the one that's struggling? It doesn't seem, we don't see a lot of people who are struggling well, who are able to talk about it and kind of invite us alongside of them. Yes. Yep. We also have these fantasy photos in our heads of what we thought things were supposed to look like, or they were going to look like, and then it's not looking like we thought that it was supposed to look like. And that puts so much pressure on us as well. All these expectations we thought, and then it's not, it's not turning out that way. And so it must be my fault. I must've done something wrong, but then there's always the mom on social media that it's looking just the way we wanted it. We thought it was supposed to look. We compare ourselves, like you said. So you start out the mom guilt chapter. And I love this quote behind every great kid is a mom who's pretty sure she's screwing it all up. I think it's very comforting. Yes. Well, and that's kind of a, that's a quote that I had found, but I've heard that, you know, I remember speaking at a mom's group and I talked about fear and the topic was fear kind of in general and what my struggle with fear and anxiety and how that expanded when I became a mom. But when I sat in on this table afterwards, I heard most of the moms, what they were talking about was the fear of not being good enough. The fear, one mom said, I'm just afraid I'm going to mess up my kid. And I looked and she had her baby next to her, like in an infant car seat. So her baby was still very small, very young. And some of the other moms, and I finally just said, well, of course, you're going to mess up your kid. We're all going to mess up our kids. If we really think that the goal or that for me to be a good mom means that when my kid becomes an adult, they're not going to have anything at all to talk about with their therapist that might be somehow related to anything that happened in our home or in our family or whatever, then I just think we are setting ourselves up for an impossible, an impossible, it's an impossible standard, but also wouldn't it be better if we created a culture in our family that said, let's get help when we need it. And as a mom, both of my college daughters actually have counselors that they go to every week. And I have to remind myself to be grateful and to be proud of them for going and getting help, even knowing that there are times that I know that they are talking about things that happened in our home. And instead of being ashamed of that, I want to just say, what do we need to talk about? What can we, how can we keep growing and moving forward? Because none of us are perfect. I mean, can you just feel even as I'm talking, like, yes, oh, lift off, like, what if that didn't have to be our goal? Yeah. Amen, sister. Well, and you know what, if we're trying to be perfect, and this is what I've learned, and it sounds like you and I were very aligned in how we felt as early on as moms, I really did think that I was going to do it all right. I really did. Yes. Now I say it, but I was going to feed them the right food. They weren't going to have the sugar. I sent them to Christian school. I even, before my daughter um, went to college, she was very strong-willed. And we said, if you go to a Christian camp, we'll get you a dog. I mean, I'm so (laughs) embarrassed to even admit that, but I just want other moms to know out there. And the dog, I wrote a blog post on it and the dog bit the neighbor. (laughs) It was, it was one of the puppy mill. I ended up loving him, but he pooped all over. You know, that was punishment on you. That was self-inflicted punishment on you. I know, that's what we do. I was so trying so hard to make everything be the way I thought it was supposed to be. 
And I had this perfectionism. And just like you said, doing that work, like I had to do a lot of work on myself. Yeah. And a lot of it. And that's how it led to me to doing what I do now. Um, And you doing what you do is all those mistakes. But there wasn't safety in the family to really talk about how you feel. Yeah. And I think that that's what we don't realize. Perfection, nobody puts so much pressure on us and our kids, even though in the book you say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I thought I was going to be perfect, but I thought I would be able to get close to it. Yes, I did. I, I thought, well, nobody's perfect, but I, I could maybe make very small allowances for myself to maybe make a little mistake here or there, but I was not prepared for what would come out of me and the brokenness that I would see in myself, just as I was, you know, routinely faced with challenges and things that felt beyond my capacity to like, you know, perfectly maneuver. So, um, so I knew that I wanted to have other moms weigh in on this. So I did my own research and I put out a couple questions on social media and I thought that moms would respond and there would be a lot of comments. And I really expected to have this great online public conversation. And I asked moms, tell me about mom guilt what kinds of things you feel guilty about? And then I said, tell me what it sounds like in your head. Like, tell me the thoughts that you have. And nobody would talk about it. People were making comments like moms were saying things like, well, you know, how much time do you have? Or gee, where do I start? Or only every day of my life, but nobody wanted to say it. So then I invited them to private message me. And I got so many messages from moms, emails from moms, And I included them in the book. I didn't put their names. I asked permission. Um, And some of the, it just broke my heart to hear a lot of the thoughts and the things that, you know, moms feel guilty about almost everything. And so much of the thing, so many of the things that they feel guilty about are not even things they have control over, like their kids getting sick or their babies not sleeping through the night, or they're not good eaters, or they, you know, they struggle in school or maybe they have a learning disability and then they get a little bit older and moms feel guilty because their kids um, aren't making good choices or they're struggling socially. Even moms whose kids have left home talked about feeling guilty that they hadn't done enough. How many moms said that they felt guilty because they couldn't provide a sibling to their only child. So even something like infertility that they have no control over, but yet they look at their child and just have this guilt that one mom that shared this with me is in her 60s and still feels that guilt because her grandchild will not will never have a cousin. And she wow. puts that on herself. Wow. You know? So that was really um, so important to get all of that feedback from moms. But And I just saw similarities across the board of the kinds of burdens that we're carrying as moms. And I was able to kind of see this different, a slight difference, kind of sneaky difference between guilt and shame, which I talk about in the book. Yes. Tell us what is the difference between guilt and shame? And then we'll talk about what we do with it because that's really, really important. Yes. So what's the difference? How do you see that? So I look at it like um, true guilt, I think is about something that I did. It's, it's an action. I took a word, words, I said something that I did that I feel bad about because I either broke a moral code. I, I hurt somebody that I love. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something that I feel is wrong. So to me, that is guilt. It's about something I did. There's clarity of wrongdoing. And there's also then clear next steps. So if I'm, you know, I can say, I'm sorry, I can take ownership for what I did, I can ask for forgiveness. Um, There's a path forward, there's ownership and forgiveness. So I think that true guilt can be very good. And we, we want to feel that and we want our kids to feel that I think so many of us have said, you know, I just I pray that my that my kids will get caught if they're doing something wrong, or I want them to feel that like I did something and it wasn't right. And I need to come clean. We want our kids to experience that true guilt that leads to really repentance and forgiveness and moving forward in a healthy way. And healing and healing. healing. Exactly. And shame is more about who we are. 
So Mm -hmm. guilt is what I did. Shame is who I am. And what I saw, the difference was guilt was, you know, I lost my temper and I yelled at my child this morning and I know that I hurt them. I need to, I need to own that and ask for forgiveness. Shame was, I'm a horrible mother. Mm -hmm. My kids deserve better than to have a mom like me. I'll never change. I'll never be able to change. And that's some of the shame that I heard was I felt really a dangerous level of shame because I think that's when people start thinking things that are really, really so harmful. You know, when you're thinking my kids would be better off without me, that's a level of shame that is so damaging and destructive, you know, and there's no next step. It's sort of just this vague sense of I'm bad but there's really nothing to do about it. And sometimes this can even happen in a conversation with somebody. It's one thing if somebody says, you did this, it hurt me, and you can respond to that. But when someone just hurls insults at you or says, you know, you are this, and there's really no clarity of what you did, there's no, you know, that's shame. That's like shaming someone. Mm -hmm. So when I think that this kind of shame grinds us down and makes us feel worthless. So it's, and then with our kids, it's also important because I think it's really important to deal with the behavior, but to make sure that we don't label our kids or label each other or label ourselves as being bad. You know, I think that's a big distinction. That is so well said. This is a generational issue. And Mm -hmm. I, and I see that now in my own life that I was like, I am never going to pass on to my kids some of the things that happened in my family growing up. I'm, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's not, but it, it looked a little different. Yeah. But until I began this healing work and used my guilt and was like, rather than looking at it like you're bad, not that I haven't done that, you know, over and over again and can still do it. But now I know what to do when I'm in the shame pit. Yes. To get myself out. Yeah. Um, But I said, I want to break this pattern in my family and I want there to be healing. And I want to have healing and I want my my kids to experience that as well. That's very different. And when we don't do that, when we have more of the shame, I feel like, and I'm just thinking of this in in the moment, that it holds our kids hostage too. Because Mm -hmm. then they, they catch it, you know, they feel like I'm not going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. But if we can have a, you talk about creating a culture Mm -hmm. in our family where we're safe Mm -hmm. to be seen, to be fully known, to make mistakes, how different that is. What do you, what have you seen in your own life about the healing work, how that is made that you've done that's made a difference in your family? Well, I think what you just shared is so, so good. And I, I kind of talk about feeling like I was handed a baton and it was broken. You know, for me, it was anger out of control. There was um, some really tough stuff that happened in my childhood growing up. So I'm given this baton. We all are. All of us are yep. given a baton that's not perfectly whole. And so to be able to look at that and then every day to make a choice, make choices that, that move us towards healing instead of continuing the same patterns. And when you were just talking, I thought about a more recent example for me, and this is what it's looked like now more in the moment I can catch myself where I'm perpetuating that brokenness instead of moving towards healing. But the amazing thing is, is that you can do a 180 and a U-turn right in the same conversation and go the other way. And before Christmas, I had to have major surgery. It was a scary thing that I, everything came out, turned out well, but it was a big deal. So my college daughters came home to be here at home and to help out. And um, my 15 year old, who I would just say is very strong willed, very determined, she will ask about something and wants to present her case. And if, if I don't say yes, then she'll come back and try for round two. And she's very, very persistent in that way. She had asked um, if she could do something. And I said, no. And this was the night before my surgery. My daughters had come home from college. I made lasagna. We were going to have a family dinner. And Brenna just kept asking me about this thing I'd already said no about. And I got real upset with her because now I felt like I want to have this nice family dinner and I want you to let this go and I'm going to have surgery tomorrow or whatever. So we went upstairs and 
you know, we're kind of hashing it out in our bedroom and we both got pretty upset and said things that we later had to apologize for. But one of the things I said to her, and as soon as I said it, I just knew this was brokenness, like coming out of my mouth. I looked at her and I said, you exhaust me. As soon as I said those words, and that was very shaming because I'm saying you exhaust me. And as soon as I said it, I knew, okay, this is the kind of thing that if I don't do a U-turn right now, and I don't take ownership for that and bring it up and say, and she didn't bring it up with me. She didn't say that was something that was hurtful when we started to do the repair work. But I came back and said, Brenna, when I said this to you, it was so wrong. And I don't want that to be like a little seed that goes down inside of you and then grows. And then somewhere down the road, you're going to have somebody else say a comment to you. And it's going to reinforce what I just said. What I should have said was I'm exhausted. Yeah, I am exhausted. And this conversation is exhausting me, but not to put that on her and say, you exhaust me. And so the beautiful thing about grace is that there was healing then right away. And she I don't think that went down inside of her and then grew roots and became this core message that's going to stick with her her whole life. I think she's going to remember the mistake I made, and that I owned it and corrected it. And then I spoke truth. Yes. Yeah. So we don't have to get it right all the time. We yes. just have to keep coming back and trying to make it right when we, when we fall short. And what a beautiful model of being in relationship that, that we pray and hope, you know, will benefit our kids in the future that she, she's learning from you how to do that because we do blow it. We do say things that are hurtful. Yeah. But if we can go back and do the repair, yeah. There's been actually lots of studies done on that. If we if we go back and do the repair, how healing that is. Yeah. And you talk about the therapy with your daughters, and I just yeah. to, you know say with with um, two of my kids, they have they have also done therapy and learned so much. And one of my kids has come back to me and has told me some of the things that I did that were really hurtful. Uh-huh. And I learned. Thankfully, I was I was working on myself and healing a lot of my yeah. own wounds that I could listen to that. Yeah. And I could say, even though it wasn't exactly the way I remember it, you know, yeah. I'm a deaf corrector. Yeah. But I knew enough to say, and it was hard. I mean, it was painful to hear some of the things that she was sharing with me, but I knew in my heart how important it was for her to tell me that if our relationship yeah. was to have healing. Yeah. And how healing it would be if I could say to her, wow, that's really hard to hear. And thank you so much for telling me that. And I'm so sorry mm-hmm. that I reacted that way and that yeah. I hurt you in those ways. Mm-hmm. And that was really powerful. And so she could tell me and I was able to take it in and mm-hmm. admit that what she was saying was true that I had hurt her. And, yeah. and that was amazing in, a, in our relationship. And it, it is, yeah. brought it to a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. But I think we don't, we didn't learn so many of us how to do that. So our relationships stay blocked and we mm-hmm. have all these resentments and hurt built up. So I love what you're sharing because yeah. then she knows she can come to you and that you're going to have that repair that you're a safe person for her. Mm -hmm. So um, that's very powerful. That's a gift. I think you gave your daughter, like you said, to listen. And if we can get somewhat accustomed to just being able to own our stuff, then we really can listen. And it doesn't have to mean I'm a horrible mother. If I agree with what they're saying. It's I'm a horrible mother if I admit that I that I messed up and that I did this wrong. And I don't think our kids see it that way either. I think it can show them that, you know, it's both and we have a lot of good things we do. We have things that are not so good, but it doesn't, you know, we are who we are. Yes. That's that whole grace piece you talk about. I had to be able to to accept my own fa- flaws and feelings. Yeah. And, and tell the truth about it, you mm-hmm. know, otherwise, I think if it had have happened, you know, of course she was little then, but 10 years earlier, I would have been very defensive. Yes. And of course we feel defensive. <laughs> I don't think that always goes away. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, anyway, so tell me how grace has played a role in this for you, because that's an important piece. Well, I see grace as a transforming power in my life. So, I mean, what that means is that every time I come back to God and I say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I did this, please forgive me. I know that I have that forgiveness. And then in my relationships to be able to come. And I know that every time I come back and I humble myself and I say, you know, I'm sorry, there can be healing and forgiveness. Um, almost always, at least on my side, what I'm trying to do. And then with myself to be able to just accept I am a person who is living daily in grace. So of course I don't want to mess up. And it's not about becoming lazy and taking advantage of that grace and saying, well, it doesn't even matter. Of course it matters. Of course it matters. But I just don't live under that burden for the most part of feeling like I'm such a failure and I'm messing everything up. And there's just a freedom that comes when you know that I'm a work in progress And my kids are works in progress and we're kind of in this together. And then I've just found as I share the feedback, I get more than anything else on the book. And if you read the reviews is just by me being so vulnerable and sharing my weaknesses, other moms are then able to know that I'm not the only one and they're able to then, and there've been groups that have done this book together. And that's the most beautiful thing ever is to see moms together reading through it and then sharing their own experiences and just experiencing what that grace actually looks like. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's my mission too. I feel like if we can, if we can share our challenges and struggles, we'll feel so much less alone and then we can give so much more grace to ourselves as yeah. a result of, of receiving that, that grace from others. Yes. And I can see how helpful your book would be in groups with moms. And because you do have those questions at the end of every chapter mm-hmm. to reflect and then yes. to be able to talk about it. Yeah, moms. I really wanted to do that. I wanted to, so the end of each section, it has review, like a little, a paragraph, and then it has reflect a couple refle- reflection questions and then a respond, which is usually a prayer, but I wanted it for a mom who was reading it individually to be able to just even kind of dive into her own heart and kind of go through the questions and connect what she just read with her own experience and her own story and then connect with God also. But I, my deeper longing was that women would be able to do it together and then use those questions together. So that's been really exciting as there have been groups that have gone through together I definitely had that in mind when I was writing it because I believe so much in the power of being in a group and walking alongside other people and sharing and then realizing I'm not the only one here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Was that scary for you to share, share vulnerably? Well, I have, I have, I feel like a really good team of people around me that are protective of me. So Uh Every, every story that I shared, even if I'm sharing about like I share a story about losing my temper again with my daughter slamming her door and the frame crashing on the floor and breaking and but even with that I, I got permission from everybody that's not just my story that's also part of her story so making sure that everybody that I shared about in the book was okay and gave me permission. Um, but I have one of my very best friends that story about slamming the door and breaking my daughter's frame after she, she read everything. I sent her all of the chapters. She was my first reader to kind of read the content. And I remember she questioned me and said, I just, you're so vulnerable. And I don't know, like, are you sure you want to do that? Or she was feeling protective of me yeah, and what yeah. people might say or think of me. She, are you sure you want to do that? And I remember just thinking, about it. And then I just thought, no, I'm, I know I'm not the only one. I have talked to enough moms to know that I'm not the only one who's ever slammed a door or I'm not the only one who's ever, uh, I just reading a really good book from an author who kicked a hole in the wall and her kids couldn't believe it. She got so mad. She kicked her foot and put a hole in the wall and then covered it up with wallpaper. And it was such a funny story, but I'm like, I know I'm not the only one. So I'm, yeah. I decided to, it was intentional. And I thought if I'm going to write a book, then I want it to be a book that will truly help moms 
not feel alone. And the only way that I know to do that is to be honest and authentic, you know? Yes. It's so counterintuitive because when we do share those struggles, then it comes, it gets, it's like comes out of us where we can share it. And then it lessens. Did you find this like the anger and the upset because you could share it with a safe person? Yes. And rather than just keeping it all inside and then it really builds up yeah, and makes it worse if yeah. we're like stuffing it, stuffing it down. Yeah. Or if we have these things, it's almost like a secret. If anybody really knew how mad I got, or if anybody really knew, then they, you know, there's that, then they wouldn't like me or they wouldn't want to be around me. And there's such a freedom in being able to say, do you really want to know me? Cause this is who I am and this is who I'm becoming. And this is the way God is working his grace in my life. And do you want to be a part of it? I mean, that's such a different way to live. It is, it is. And of course we have to do it with safe people that we feel yes. are safe. Yeah, definitely. I think you have to be with people that, you know, are safe people that aren't going to, that are going to hold what you share, you know, with care you know, not be careless with what they come to know about you. Mm -hmm. You talk about, uh, here, I'll I'll, uh, quote you. Our most despised weaknesses can can become tools God uses. Can you share more? Yes. So I tell the story in the book about my friend, Tricia, who her little guy was in first grade last year. So she went to school uh, to pick him up. And she overheard one of the other moms say that her little girl had been so excited for Super Reader Day. And my friend Trisha, just her heart sank because she forgot. It was Super Reader Day. She was supposed to send Jack to school with his favorite stuffed animal, his favorite book and a blanket. And she totally forgot. So here she's thinking, oh my gosh, it probably he probably had a terrible day. And she was just beating herself up with guilt. And Jack comes out of school and he seems like he's okay. And then she has this conversation with him and he tells her, you know, I was disappointed when I saw that I didn't have what I needed in my backpack, but I went to my teacher. I told her I didn't have it. She let me pick a book um, off of her shelf and she had extra stuffed animals. So I picked one of those and I sat on the floor and I read it and she said, I'm so sorry that I forgot. And he said, that's okay. I forgive you. And the story just touched my heart. I thought here she's taught her kid how to be gracious and forgiving. But also I thought like, look at what he did. He, he went to his teacher and he problem solved and he was able to be flexible and it didn't ruin his day just because he didn't have the things that he wanted to have. And I thought as parents, I think we all say we want to raise flexible, resilient kids who know how to problem solve and to empathize and forgive and to be gracious with others And we want them to understand that the world is not perfect and that things aren't always going to go their way. And yet we keep trying to be perfect and thinking that we have to be perfect. And um, I heard someone say to me, you know, I think we would actually be doing our kids a disservice if somehow we were able to be perfect because that would not prepare them for the real world. So when I talk about how God can use even our weaknesses or our failures, I think he uses it to equip our kids. Yes. For the real world for the real yeah. spouse they're going to have someday for the real, you know, employers they're going to work for and the friends they're going to have everyone is going to let them down at some point. And so, you know, I think if our hearts are right, and we keep coming back to do that repair work that you were talking about, I do think that he can use all of it for good to equip yes. our kids. Yes, absolutely. I love that story. That was yeah. so sweet. And I can totally relate to it. Yes, we all can. I know the different things I've done where I've forgotten something or, yeah. oh gosh, why don't you just feel so badly when that happens, but that he figured it out. Yes. And, and I think that that's one of the reasons that we rescue our kids, at, even as they're older, mm-hmm. is we're, we don't want them to that suffer that discomfort. Yes. And yet we're doing a real disservice to them because they can fi- they usually do figure it out. I remember yep. my son going and it was like an hour away with baseball and he forgot some equipment and I couldn't go back. 
and he like borrowed cleats or something yeah. and he, you know, he figured it out and I think he had to wear dirty pants or something and that was fine, but yeah. it all ended up being okay. And yeah. here I was panicked about it, but sometimes we jump in too quickly. Yes. Because even that, what you're describing, it kind of pushes our kids to have to live in a vulnerable, at a certain point, vulnerably in front of others and say, I, I need this. I need a pair of pants. I need cleats. And that's what we want. We want to, I, I want to raise daughters who can go ask for help when they need it and don't have to feel like they have to pretend that they have it all together. So if we do that and we try to create this world where everything goes as perfectly as possible, we're only then teaching them that they have to do that. And they'll be carrying the same burdens then when they become adults that we've been carrying that we're trying to get rid of. It's like you talk about breaking that cycle. One of the ways that happens is by our shortcomings. You know, you know that's so well said. It, it, it's so, it, that is so true. Because I remember like, oh my gosh, I should know this. I should have this. I'm so embarrassed. I mean, even as an adult, like I don't want them to know. <laughs> yeah. I forgot this. Rather than, you know, oh, you know, holding it lighter. Oh, I forgot, yes. man, yeah. you know, I'm so upset that I forgot, but then it ends up usually it's like, Cheryl, it, it all worked out. Everyone survived. Yeah. It wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. That's good. Thank you, Becky, for that. Um, yes. Let's talk about anxiety because you mm-hmm. write about having anxiety and, and let's talk about fear because that's a biggie. Especially yeah. when our kids are starting to pull away, they enter into the teen years, we don't have as much control, we wave goodbye to them as they drive off in the car, they start dating. I mean, there's just, they're on social media. I mean, there's just, oh, yeah. it's a minefield of fear. Yeah. How have you coped with your own anxiety? I've, I've struggled with anxiety. Mm-hmm. What, um, what has helped you with that? What have you learned about yourself? Well, I... I feel like anxiety has its own sort of journey and it's looked different in different seasons of my life. But from the time I was a child, I had so much fear Um, with the chaos in my home growing up. I started stuttering when I was in third grade. I don't know why. I didn't even know I was doing it, but the teacher saw it and, you know, tried to intervene with a speech therapist, but it really just snowballed after that. And when I realized there was something wrong with me. So then I had extreme anxiety about going to school and speaking and I stuttered into my 20s. I mean, it just kept me from doing anything where I would have to speak to people. So I I lived under this um, just extreme anxiety and letting anxiety really call the shots for me if I was invited to go do something. Nope, I might have to talk. So I'm not going to go. So um And then becoming a mom, um, you know, and all of the anxieties that you just talked about with that, with all just what if this happens or what if this happens? And I think for me personally, it's kind of a, an abstract concept, but I think what has freed me more than anything is there's a verse in the Bible that says that God's perfect love drives out fear. And so at one point I remember thinking, what if I'm focusing on the wrong thing? Like, what if I'm just focused on my anxiety and how to get rid of it? But this verse is telling me that God's love is greater and more powerful. And it's almost like I could just picture it. The more that I could be filled up with it, the more it would push the fear out of my life. And that's what I've experienced professionally as I started speaking and with the things I'm doing in my work life now is I don't have to. I can be really secure in God's love for me. I don't have to be afraid that what people are going to think about me or that maybe I'm not going to look a certain way or, you know, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, those kinds of things. I can feel secure knowing that I am loved by God, (laughs) by his perfect love. Um, But then the way that that kind of comes into different parts of my life, the most recent thing for me, and I don't understand it, it's kind of crazy, but I've had an extreme fear of flying for probably 15 years. So much so that I have medicine that I take before I get on the plane to help me just because it's a panicky feeling I have. Well, after this last year of not flying, um, I flew to Little Rock um, a few weeks ago with my daughter and I wasn't afraid to fly. 
like at all. Like the night before, I didn't think about it falling asleep. I woke up, we were eating our Starbucks breakfast sandwiches at the airport gate. And I'm like, why am I not afraid? I'm not afraid at all. Got on the plane. I was like, nope, I'm not nervous at all. And <laughs> my daughter, and she, my daughter's very insightful. And she just said, well, maybe for you, this last year has been filled with so many big things that are out of your control. The pandemic, you know, my daughter's getting married and moving away. I had to have the surgery that was so like scary and out of my control and had the possibility for there to be something serious as a result of what they might find. So I just had all these big fears. And she said, maybe you've just had practice over the last year of just having to let go because there's stuff is so out of your control. So I don't know if that was it, but I know that when we came back from our trip and I got on the plane coming home, again, I was not scared. And all of a sudden I just had this thought, it's not my job to fly this plane. That's not my job. Like, I don't know how to fly. I, I don't have any training. That's there's, there's someone in here who that's their job. They've been trained. This is their job to fly this plane and get me home. I have nothing to do with it. So I can either sit here terrified or I can sit here and just like, it's just not my job. And I've been thinking about that. And I actually wrote a, a blog post about it. And I've thought about all the other things in my life that I could say, that's not my job. It's not my job to make sure that my kids are happy all the time. It's not my job to make other people like me. It's not my job to fix other people's problems. Yes. You know, and we can't control it. All you these can't things control that we try and control, like you said, you can't drive the plane. Yeah. It's not and my it's job. Like all we can do. I mean, we could walk out tomorrow and something happen. Yeah. We're vulnerable all the time, but why do we think we can control these things? <laughs> yeah. But that is so cool. And what, how wise of your daughter to say that. Yeah. You know, to you, because that makes sense to me, actually. Does it? Yeah, it does. But you have, you have stepped so much out of your comfort zone. And I remember you saying to me on our first call, you're like, I've, I have just learned, I'm just trusting God and I'm just putting myself out there. Yeah. And, and that really helped me because if we're in fear, we're not going to put ourselves out there. And, and it goes for our kids too. If we're living in fear, we're going to hold our kids back Yeah, because we're going to be so afraid to let them Mm -hmm. go. And, and I have struggled with that myself and, um, but knowing it's like, what, what can we do when we're in that fearful place? And one of the things I hear you saying is acknowledging what we can, what we can't control, which is probably 95%. So much. (laughs) I know. And then for me, so it's, what does it look like to surrender? Because for me, at least the anxiety and the fear is me just trying to hold on to it, even though it's not, it's not mine to hold on to. I really, truly, that's what was so like, almost like, this is such a no brain statement to say, like, it's not my job to fly the plane, like, duh, of course. But for me, it was like, so eye opening, like, why do I think that I have anything to do with this? I don't, it's totally out of my hands. And I can't control any part of it at all. And I, I think that is how this last year has felt with, um, with everything. And I think for some people, though, I'm, I think their anxiety has kicked up and is even worse yes, over yes. the last year. So it's not, I don't know how to like take what I just said and translate it to make it work for everybody. But I think it comes back to being able to surrender and being able and with our kids, it's really hard, but, but recognizing they really belong to God. And can I trust him? That's like the biggest question. And that's what I keep coming back to. And when you had said earlier about somebody saying, you know, sometimes people write books or they talk like they have it all together and they know all the answers. And this book is definitely not that. And I find myself going back and reading sections of this book, like, because it still helps me because it's, I'm not there yet either. And I'm not, I'm never going to be there. I still need the message that I wrote about for myself. Yeah. 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 I love that. You're going back and reading it. It's like, I always teach what I need to hear all the time and write what I need to hear. So I, it's like replacing those voices and those lies that hold us back and rob us of our joy and 
So that's neat. You're reading it through again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's like, what are you reading? I'm like, I'm reading my own book, chapter 10, about how to let go when your kids go. You know, it's like, it's helping me. What can I say? <laughs> I know I've thought about recording myself when I'm like driving in the car, like a loving message. You're oh. okay. <laughs> I love you. You know, like. Yes. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, Cheryl. Yeah, you're good enough. You're smart enough. <laughs> so, so this is so great. And we're going to have you back on. You already said yes, because yes. there's just so many other things I want to talk about. Yeah. Talk about. So maybe next month or the, you know, the month after, uh, after that, but we're not going to wait too long. Becky, um, there's a verse that you share in the book that I feel is very encouraging whether people read scripture or not, whoever's listening, I just love this so much. Um, can you share that verse about just not allowing ourselves to be so burdened down? Yeah. And, and Jesus's words. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So this is right when I'm talking about the burdens of perfectionism, comparison, the guilt, unrealistic expectations, and how these are, these burdens that we carry around that are backbreaking and we were never meant to carry them. So this is a verse that's Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And it's, um, it says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Jesus is talking, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love that. Yeah. Freely and lightly. What a great way to end. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for this book. Thank you for being vulnerable and being open and for sharing your story and the stories of other moms and making this available to experience healing and more joy and freedom in our lives. So Thank you. tell, yeah, tell our listeners where to find you. So you can find me. Um, my website is my full name, Becky. The last name is B A U D O U I N um, dot com. And on the website, you can find out about the books. If you're listening and you don't have time to write down my last name, which is kind of hard, you can just Google enjoy every minute book and it'll come up. Um, but I also have the first three chapters available on my website. If you want to just read a free excerpt to see what you think. So you can find that there. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram with my full name, Becky Baldwin. Excellent. Well, and I'll put the links in there too. Okay, so perfect. it's every minute. Enjoy every minute and other ridiculous things we say to moms. Is yes. the title. And but the one is every minute dot a book, every minute book. Um yeah, if you're if you're just Googling it, you can just Google enjoy every minute book and it'll come up. Enjoy every minute book, which yeah, is one the, of the, the myths, title. by the way. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the title and it's the first myth. Yeah. So, all right, Becky. Well, thank you so, so much. It was, hey, it was thank you. a very um, worthwhile, meaningful conversation today. Yeah, it was great. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, that's it for the show today. And thank you so much for joining me. And just so you know what's coming up, I am going to be offering a three day. It'll be one hour each day. I do it on Wednesday, Thursday, and Fridays, a tech technology free workshop. And it's going to be coming up at the end of next month, I believe. And we will be letting you know about those dates soon. I'll let you know next week. And I would love for you to go to momsoftweensandteens.com, get signed up for our newsletter so you can hear about when we're going to be doing that. And there's replays available. And also, 
Next week, I'm excited to have Dr. Melanie McNally on the show, and we're going to be talking about mental health and helping our kids to heal and transition back into regular life after all that we have been through this past going on 14 months. So you'll want to listen to that and how you can help your kids. So thanks so much for joining me and have a great week and see you back here next time.